Under force circulation, we monitor the sight glasses to make sure that we've gotten rid of all of the gas bubbles. Mm. This is a drain tank. That's the drain tank. The drain tank and the filling process and emptying process actually work quite nicely. We've been quite impressed with how well and easily we can control the rate at which we transfer fluid over into the loop and fill it all the way to the top. It's the sum of the resistances around the loop that gives rise to the balance between pump head and flow rate, or with natural convection, the balance between the buoyantly driven flow from the temperature difference and the flow rate around the loop. The big goal of this machine here is to simulate how decay heat is removed from this design when there's a shutdown. That is correct. In January of 2015, Professor Per Peterson toured Kirk Sorensen through UC Berkeley's Compact Integral Effects Test for pebble and molten salt fueled reactors. Kirk also presented at UC Berkeley. We're going to talk mostly about uh, the chemical processing and a little bit about the power conversion system as well. And the University of Utah. Actinides in general govern our waste disposition strategy. A brief moment from Kirk's presentation at UC Berkeley is included for context, but this video focuses on Kirk's tour through CIET. I'd already been working with, uh, with live and with molten salt technology for quite some time for fusion applications. Kurt, he, he showed up and he had this stack of CDs NASA had, had gotten, which were the first scanned copies of these Oak Ridge reports back from the molten salt reactor experiment. And he handed them over to me and I started looking through these reports and papers and realized <coughs> that he discovered a treasure trove. This, this, was, this was going to change the world. And indeed, it has had a big effect since then uh, uh, in terms of allowing us to reestablish and advance uh, molten salt technology for application to nuclear energy. And to, to make rapid progress here at Berkeley, we've been working on reactor technologies that would use molten salts as coolants. There's also significant interest and good reasons to work on the liquid fuel variants of this technology. I want to uh, brag on Pear here a little bit because uh, when I was at NASA, I, I, I did get very interested in, in molten salt reactor technology and, and finagled some funds to get those documents scanned. I made bunches and bunches of copies of CDs for all you young people. This is almost like kind of pre-internet. Yeah, we had it, but you know, your website would hold about 20 megabytes. So CDs were the only way to really move around big data. S sneaker net was probably the better way to describe it. So I made these for the Secretary of Energy and delivered them in, in DC and I sent them to lab directors. Nobody cared. Nobody cared at all. The only person who cared was Pear. And, and I'm really, really glad he did because I think he feels the same way about this technology that I do, that it's really exciting. And it's going to be fun to have you visit around the rest of the day. We'll have some tours also and you'll be able to see some of the stuff that we're doing. Excellent. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm here to see. <laughs> okay. Now, this is a laboratory, so please watch your step. Don't touch things that you don't think you should touch, and I will tell you if you're getting close to anything that is hazardous, okay? There was a nuclear reactor in here long ago. I, I'm guessing it was... Uh, yes, back there. That was a target room, and then the pool actually was demolished and pulled out. We've got these cranes that we can move things around so we can put in shielding, and this is where we do high temperature materials. Uh, testing and research, including we're doing work on these uh, high temperature heat exchangers for supercritical CO2 power conversion. This compact integral effects test oil loop that we've developed, which is a 50% height scaled replica for a fluoride salt cooled high temperature reactor loop. So the scaling between the SIET facility here on the left, and this is the Mark I PBFHR design that we've developed. Now this is a pebble bed, fluoride salt cooled pebble bed reactor. Here's the annular pebble bed core. Uh, coolant uh, flows in uh, through the bottom of the core, up through, out, in through a hot well, and then from the hot well it is pumped by uh, cantilevered, overhung centrifugal pumps through the air heater, and then back up into the reactor. And so that's the loop that you have for force circulation through 
the, uh, uh, through the primary system to transfer heat to air that is coming. These are, there's two of these coiled tube air heaters and there's air ducts that bring air from a GE Frame 7 gas turbine that's been modified for the external heating uh, to these air heaters. The air comes in, flows up, out through the tube bundle and you'll see a, an example of a tube bundle and then back over to the turbines and that's how we heat the air up to 670 degrees which is the temperature it goes into the turbine uh, for expansion. Now the key thing in, in this design is that we also have passive safety. So normal shutdown cooling we use the primary loop to extract heat through these uh, uh, air coolers because we can regulate and control flow rates and the heat removal and it's a good principle for normal shutdown cooling to have the system be active so that you can control but also so that you've got some diversity because you want your emergency decay heat removal to be fully passive, no electrical power, highly reliable uh, so that you have confidence that even if all of your electricity is gone that you'll still be able to remove decay heat after you shut down. And so what you see here are the, we call them thermosiphon cooled heat exchangers. These are very similar in design to the decay heat removal system that was developed for the molten salt breeder reactor at Oak Ridge, uh, except that now we're removing heat from the reactor vessel, not from the drain tank. But besides that, this is a mol separate molten salt loop uh, that operates purely by buoyancy forces, purely by gravity. Uh, and uh, salt from the core, after you shut off the pumps, salt from the core flows up because it's hot, and then down through a heat exchanger cavities, we call DHXs, and then back through the core. And this flow is entirely due to buoyancy forces. Likewise, in this DRAX, direct reactor auxiliary cooling system loop, the salt which is, is um, uh, heated in that heat exchanger flows up and then transfers heat to a set of water-cooled thermosiphon pipes and then it flows back down because it's cold into the DHX. And what the SEAT experiment is capable of doing is replicating the, uh, these forced circulation and natural circulation processes. Again, because you, if you match these key non-dimensional parameters for fluid mechanics, Prantl, Reynolds, Froud, Grashoff, then in a scaled system you can replicate the convective heat transfer, both natural circulation and force circulation. So in a sense this is like a giant liquid computer. It's computing the way this would work yep. with a different fluid. And what's really interesting is that this also you learn a lot. For example, um, uh, one of the key things that you find when you build a loop like this and actually try to experimentally get natural circulation to occur and stuff is that if you get bubbles trapped in the system, which when you fill things, you generally do, they can change the behavior. So in this loop, we've got lots of transparent locations where we can see bubbles and where we can vent them from the high places so that we can f get all of the uh, trapped gases out after, uh, once we've filled it. Well, it's really important when you design the salt system also to make sure that it's not going to have high points that are going to trap gas in ways that you didn't expect. And the lessons that you learn in, in designing and operating the oil loop, particularly because you can instrument it so much better and you can get visualization of the flows and stuff, the lessons you learn make it better, easier to do good design for the, the molten salt systems because when you up at 600 degrees centigrade, it's a different environment in terms of you know, instrumentation. Transparent pipes and so forth. Yeah, tr transparent pipes um, are Things tough you to can do. Stand next to. <laughs> you might get little windows in, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we do, you can you can put fly into a test tube and and heat it up and melt it and you can see it, but you can't build glass. Yeah, can. yeah. Glass molten salt loops. That's, that would be bad. <laughs> well, they 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 they'd probably break, <laughs> and then and then you make a mess. So this is a way to visualize flow and, and learn how the flow is going to work in a pretty forgiving Correct. environment. Correct. And furthermore, it's heavily instrumented. So we measure flow rates using Coriolis meters, which are extraordinarily accurate. So all of the flow rates through all of the branches can be measured with high accuracy over a wide range, all the way from the force circulation flow rates down to the few percent flow rates needed to remove decay heat. Uh, likewise, we've got an, uh, about 40 different places where we've got thermocouples. So we can measure temperatures with very high fidelity. And we have 16 different places where we have manometer lines that allow us to make very, very accurate measurements of the pressure. 
And so by being able to measure pressure, temperature, and flow distributions with very high fidelity through the loop, uh, we're able to, to validate our models that are supposed to predict, especially we really want to know how much flow are we getting uh, and what are the temperatures. Mm -hmm. right. the, the scaled height of all of the major heat sources and sinks uh, is scaled to match uh, what we have in the system. And it's pretty close. We had to finalize the design for SEAT before we'd completely finished the design for the uh, Mark I reactor. Uh, so, if, for example, the, the height of the coiled tube sink is a bit low compared to where our simulated heat sink is, which is simulated with, an, with a fan-cooled oil cooler. Um, but they're pretty close, and by using the codes, we can actually assess the effects of these distortions, because in the codes, we can change these parameters and see what the effect of moving the elevation of the heat sources in sink up and down is going to be. Of course, as you make a loop taller, you can drive stronger natural convection and you'll have smaller temperature difference needed to move the same amount of heat. So this is, this is the scaling principle behind SIAT. And we can run not just steady state conditions, but also we can study transients. That is, for example, if we trip the primary pumps and we're no longer able to remove heat uh, uh, at the same rate that we were before, we can see how the system responds and how the start up and increase in heat removal uh, uh, occurs in the Drax loop. And doing these types of experiments is one of the principal ways in which we've been able to license passively safe light water reactors. So the passive safety systems that are used in the AP1000 and the ESBWR and in, in essentially all of the light water reactor SMR designs like New Scale and Westinghouse SMR and Empower. In all of those cases, the way that we validate the simulations or the models for the passive decay heat removal uh, is with this type of integral effects testing. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but things like New Scale, uh, their simulated testing is also done with water. They have to use water to simulate water. It's a big, yeah. And so, so you're able to get a higher fidelity here by using this uh, organic fluid to simulate salt. That's correct. So, so for water-cooled reactors, uh, some work was done in the past uh, to do scaled experiments using Freon. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really bad idea these days because you, you, you know this is a greenhouse gas uh, emitting stuff. And so, uh, but the principal fluid that's been used in the integral effects testing to validate our safety models for light water reactors has been water. Which and when you use the same fluid to simulate the fluid mm -hmm. you want, there's things you can't match, right? Right. So the principal things that you end up doing, I mean, the, the reason that we do integral effects testing rather than performing experiments in prototypical reactor scale systems. You know, in principle, for example, a design basis accident for a pressurized water reactor that is evaluated in which we believe the reactors can respond safely is what's called a large break loss coolant accident. Might actually be physically impossible, but you could think about going to a real big pressurized water reactor, the real thing, getting high explosives, strapping it onto the cold leg of the reactor, and blowing Taking that leg, take, take the pipe apart, mm. and, and do the test. Um, there's a number of reasons why that's just a bad idea. There's a lot of reasons. There, there's a lot of reasons why that's a bad idea. And in general, we want to verify that even under really severe conditions, we understand how reactor safety systems will, will behave. And the best way, once we're getting into rather severe conditions, is to, to make use of simulations validated by scaled experiments. I think that would surprise people, though, to realize that the best way to simulate a fluid is with a different fluid, not with the same fluid. Because your first impression would be, if I want to simulate water, I should use water. Yep, yep. But if you want to do a scaled effect, that's not the case. This is one of the reasons why one of the sets of experiments that we've run, we understand that fundamentally mass, momentum, and energy are conserved. Mm -hmm. there's, there's copious reasons to believe that that is true. And when you do the scaling of the conservation equations correctly for mass conservation, momentum conservation, energy conservation, you find that these non-dimensional parameters emerge. Like Reynolds if, number. Reynolds number, Prandtl number. If you then um, uh, scale the boundary conditions so that the geometry is reproduced, 
what you can prove through experimentation is that, that actually the fluid mechanics and heat transfer will be matched. So you've made it the same. So right. by having a reactor yeah. vessel that's maybe half the size of the real thing, you can actually have a very accurate fluid simulation. That's correct. So a couple of things that's generally done in the scaling for this kind of integral effects tests, the, the scaling, for example, there's an apex integral effects test facility at Oregon State, which was used to generate data license, used for licensing of the AP1000. A general approach is that to reduce the amount of electrical power that's needed, uh, you will do what's called area scaling. That is, you won't try to replicate the full flow area. You'll scale all of the different pipes in all of the different regions down to some reduced area. But you preserve then the height effects that occur so that you can preserve all of the buoyantly driven flow phenomena. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is also something that we've done here. This is a reduced area loop. But all of the heights and all of the losses in the loop match, and therefore the transient steady state response will also match. Now, to demonstrate that the oil actually does match what happens with salts, we've also compared separate effect test data for things such as, as heat transfer measurements that were made in heated tubes, which is an important way to measure heat transfer coefficient for the design of heat exchangers. And this data was collected at Oak Ridge back in the 1970s, and when we compare it with the data that we collect with oil, we find that the non-dimensional heat transfer coefficients match to within 1 to 2 percent. Oh, that's very good. Which is, which is particularly in, you know, these complex region, regimes of heat transfer that you get between laminar and transition flow, and, and it matches quite nicely. What we want to do is to identify additional opportunities where we can make direct comparisons between salt and oil to further increase our confidence and convince regulatory agencies that oil does match. But again, it, it, it will, just because of the scaling. So really the big goal of this machine here is to simulate how decay heat is removed from this design when there's a shutdown. That is correct. Okay, well, let's go take a look. That's the bottom line, here. Okay, now again, everybody watch your step. So there's things you can trip on. This loop is scaled to be 50% of the height of an actual FHR reactor, at least our most recent designs for small modular versions. And it's also close to height for what you might find for a liquid fueled molten salt reactor too, because they'll end up being of comparable size mm -hmm. uh, since you're removing compa moving, uh, comparable amounts of heat. Now, uh, the, what you see here is, of course, a whole bunch of piping that's covered by insulation. This is Schedule 10 stainless steel piping. So the first thing is that we have a drain tank. So everybody who likes drain tanks, this is a drain tank. That's the drain tank. And we have the ability to pressurize it to push the oil in, push it back in. and to drain it back down again. And we've done that a couple of times already. Uh, because we have many places in this loop where it's transparent, we can actually closely monitor uh, as we fill the loop with oil. But the drain tank and the filling process and emptying process actually work quite nicely. We've been quite impressed with how well and easily we can control the rate at which we transfer flow a fluid over into the loop and fill it all the way to the top. Under the insulation is where we have these three of the Coriolis low meters. We have a primary pump right down here. We put it into a different location in the loop for simplicity uh -huh. because in a forced and natural circulation loop it runs in single phase. It's the sum of the loop resistances around the loop that gives rise to the balance between pump head and flow rate or with natural convection the balance between the buoyantly driven flow from the temperature difference and the flow rate around the loop. Uh, so you'll also note here are some large copper cables coming in and exiting resistance, resistance and this is this is direct current low voltage uh, resistance heating uh, the power actually comes right from his cabinet over here which is a set of solid state DC power supplies that are computer controlled okay. and we can put up to 10 kilowatts of heat into this loop which in salt would be equivalent to half a megawatt okay. of heat because which of is that a scaling relationship between the oil and the salt it's very convenient and so the was the, it just kind of dumb luck that it happened to be so favorable in that direction that the we only had there's to put it there, you, when when you look at how well the scaling works with oil and how convenient it is and how much easier it is to instrument and operate 
And, and all of the things that, that work really well when you try to perform experiments with oil to, to simulate these systems, it makes you believe there must be a higher power that has <laughs> sometimes every now and then smiles down on us. So, so how did you learn that, that this was possible? Was there a student who approached you and showed you some calculations? Because I don't think anybody's yeah. done this before. We'd, we'd already known, and it was it, it, for just the hydrodynamics, uh, we've been using water as a simulant fluid because if it's, you're just worried about pressure drops and fluid mechanics, all you need to match is the Reynolds number and the geometry. And a student of mine was working on making turbulence measurements using something called particle image velocimetry in a swirling flow inside a tube. This was for fusion applications of, of fly. Right? And it, he was not able with his laser to interrogate really close to the wall of the tube where the most interesting stuff has happened with laminar sublayers and stuff. So he switched to using mineral oil uh, in a quartz tube so he could get matched index of refraction. It was working quite nicely. Uh, then one day he came into my office, and this would have been 2006, and the student's name, by the way, is Philippe Bardet. He's an assistant professor at George Washington University now. And he came into my office and said, you know, I was just looking at the properties here, and the Prandtl number of this oil matches the Prandtl number of salt. So maybe we could use it to do heat transfer experiments in addition to the fluid mechanics experiments. And so we worked around and performed the scaling and re realized that in fact we could, we could match simultaneously all of the key non-dimensional parameters that come out of the energy equation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, you can get uh, for force circulation, you've got Reynolds and you've got Prandtl. And then for natural convection, you, get, you can match Grashoff. And, and as soon as we saw that, and it, uh, that, that was when we knew that we needed to look really carefully at using this as a simulant fluid for heat transfer and so this, fluid mechanics. This technique then is, is developed right here at Berkeley. Nobody's it was invented here, yes. All right, well, that's It was wonderful. invented here, yeah. By Another wonderful thing invented at Berkeley, <laughs> along with energy from thorium. <laughs> that's correct. So a few other key instruments. You'll see lots and lots of places where there's wires coming out. Each of these is a thermocouple. Okay. Um, now, one of, the, one of the important things you need to be careful with, uh, for example, we heat oil going through this annular heater. Where it comes out, uh, we want to know what is the average temperature of the oil. But it's not guaranteed that once it comes out that the oil has been perfectly mixed. And in fact, the oil, depending on how it flowed up through the heater, will emerge at different temperatures, mm -hmm. logically. And you want to make sure that it's mixed before you measure the temperature so that you know that you're measuring the temperature which is important for your energy balances, not just some local temperature in the oil that's different from the average. Well, every single place where we measure temperature at the outlet of a heater, what we do is we measure it in two different locations, downstream of a mixer. And by doing that, we can compare those two temperatures and verify that we're not erroneously measuring a local temperature that is different from the actual average temperature. Mm -hmm. And this is one of, the key, one of the key sorts of things. There's a number of important design principles in, in making and putting together these sorts of loops that you either learn from experience or you get data that you can't explain, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, so this is one. Uh, one other device that you can see here, let me see if I can point to, yes, this is an example right here. You see this clear Teflon tubing? And there's another one here. These are manometer ports. And up above us, we have a manometer rack. And by measuring pressure using manometer lines, we can actually directly measure head. And that means that we do not need to do calibration, which would be the case if we were using um, uh, pressure transducers instead. Now, that's, that's actually a substantial benefit a part of the reason that we can do it is because in these salt systems, the pressure drops needed to generate flow are very low. Uh, there are systems, there are many systems where it's just not practical to try to measure pressure with manometers because you get enormous head differences when you start and run and force circulation, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the case of, of the oils, they have this tremendously high volumetric heat capacity which means that very low volumetric flow rates can move very large amounts of energy around. Very low volumetric flow rates mean low pressure drop. Mm -hmm. And the evidence for that is that we can actually, over the full range of flows that we're interested in, measure the pressure drops quite nicely using manometers 
And the beauty of using manometers is that they can be very, very accurate measurements. And in characterizing the loop after uh, we uh, filled it, we ran isothermal, uh, room temperature, uh, many different flow rates, and measured pressure drops so that we can characterize the loss coefficients and the flow losses and verify that they match what we want to have in trying to match the actual prototypical reactor design. Um, so those are the three major types of instruments that we have, flow plus pressure uh, plus temperature. In addition, uh, we have the capability to control the loop. So the pumps and then up above, we'll see in a moment, the, the heat sinks are actually oil coolers that have fan coolers. Those are all driven with variable frequency drives. And we've been doing all of the testing and showing that we can control the pump speeds and the fan speeds to control the flow rates and control the heat removal addition uh, from the loop. Of course, under natural circulation, uh, the loop will operate in the way that it naturally wants to in order to balance uh, 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 heat removal with flow. And you'll get a temperature drop that is what we want to predict because we don't want it to take too large of a delta T between the hot and the cold part of the natural circulation loop to move the heat that needs to be removed. And therefore, our ability to show that we can predict during transients the temperature drops uh, from location to location of the loop is probably the most single most important thing that we do uh, with the safety codes and therefore the single most important thing that we're validating by doing this series of experiments with the SIEP facility. You'll see that this level is labeled level one. The one down below us is labeled level zero. It's important for us that we are operating the experiment the way that we think we should. Okay, so we have a full quality assurance program and if you think through all of the things, kinds of mistakes you can make that you want to minimize the frequency of, one obvious type of mistake is that you could have a valve in the wrong position. Mm -hmm. It could be closed when it was supposed to be opened. And if you've done that, then the system is going, not going to behave the way that you expect it to. So to perform experiments, it's important for us to verify that all of the valves are in the positions that we want to have them in for that particular experiment. And therefore, we label levels and we have tables. And the students, in starting up and running through their detailed procedure for an experiment, will systematically go valve by valve to confirm that it's in the correct position. Then as they evolve through the experiment, if there's valves that need to be repositioned, uh, for example, we have a full fill-up procedure and we don't want to overflow things and such. And so as you're filling to certain levels, you open and close valves. And again, this is all driven by procedure and we, we document and then put that into a database uh, so that we can verify that we really know how the experiment was run. Has the facility been filled up yet? The facility is full as we speak. Uh -huh. uh, we have been doing initial heated testing. We did isothermal testing to measure pressure drops. We're now in the phase of doing heated testing. Our next stage is actually going to be to come in with infrared camera. And while we've got the loop heated, we're going to be looking for all of the places, and there's going to be plenty of them, like these valves and stuff, where we're losing heat. Yeah. And the next stage is going to be to come in and add additional insulation at those locations so we can bring the heat losses down further because those actually represent distortions compared to what the prototypical full area system would look like. And what is the general temperature range that the oil will go through as it goes through the loop? Generally, we're going to be running at oil temperatures around 80 degrees centigrade, okay. which is where we're pretty close to matching FLYB at about 650 degrees. Typical temperature drops in the PBFHR are about 100 degrees from the core inlet to the outlet. Mm -hmm. And in the scale world with oil, that translates to about 30 degrees delta T. Okay, so 50C to 80C roughly. Yeah, exactly. And the, what we'll do is once we've, we've minimized heat losses by using infrared imaging, we'll characterize and measure those heat losses because when we run at a fixed flow rate with heat input, and we know what the flow rates are in different legs of the loop, we measure temperature drop between those positions and we can estimate the, the rate of heat loss. What we'd like to do is to make it small. Mm -hmm. The next stage is that uh, we're going to be installing uh, insulated shutter system that will roll up and down on the front. Oh, I see. 
because no. we're going to we're going to put a nice big electric heater in here heat this up to be close to the oil temperature then the temperature drop across the insulation drops further this is called guard heating and when you get the temperature drop on the on the insulation down uh, then your heat losses go down as well mm -hmm. and you further reduce the distortion in the experiment caused by having heat leaking out of the loop and that, that way it more closely matches the design of the system that you're that's to correct yeah and that's what we'd like to do is to get it to behave as close as possible to the actual physical system mm -hmm. and then we just run all sorts of different transients on it including things that you wouldn't physically be able to want to or be able to do in the actual loop itself or in an actual reactor itself. So you, one of the things you mentioned earlier was this type of a simulated scaled experiment has been used to help license other reactors. Yes. The, what, um, the very earliest light water reactors that were built did not have emergency core cooling systems. And when it was recognized that uh, if you lost your ability to provide your normal cooling to the core, or if you had a loss of coolant accident where a pipe would break, uh, that you could have very bad consequences of having fuel overheat, especially in light water reactors, because in light water reactors, if you allow fuel to be uncovered and you allow it to heat up, uh, the cladding will react with steam to the, form hydrogen. The zirconium cladding. Yeah, the zirconium cladding. And as the fuel overheats to temperatures where it begins to lose its physical integrity and have localized melting, in the chemical conditions that you have with water, highly oxidized conditions, cesium and iodine are very volatile. Mm -hmm. And they, they evaporate out, form small condense of small particles Aerosols. and you have intrinsically high pressure and so you therefore have physical mechanisms a dispersion term yeah that can mobilize cesium and iodine now we designed the reactors to make that very unlikely yeah. uh, through a combination of highly reliable cooling systems passive systems are better than active as we learned at Fukushima but the physical mechanism remains the physical mechanism remains whereas in a salt reactor in a salt reactor cesium there's nothing that cesium loves more than fluorine and it will it will it will compete with anything else to grab a hold of fluorine and cesium fluoride is very, very low volatility and very high solubility in salt. So no aerosols, doesn't want to form an aerosol and, yeah. now, and no driving term to make it want to get out. Now, either. now one, of, one of the key things for the solid fuel, cesium is locked up in the fuel for sure. Mm -hmm. um, xenon, which you want to get out of the primary salt for your fuel salt, uh, xenon decays to cesium. So the one thing we have to be cautious about with the fluid fuel and do it right is to make sure that the xenon decays and we get that cesium back into salt mm -hmm. after, after the xenon decays. And this, is, this, this has to do with the off-gas system design, which of yeah. course you've looked at a lot and many others have as well. Yeah, and I think one of the thoughts in that way was to uh, use the drain tank, which had a certain amount of fuel salt in the bottom. Anyhow, As right. a logical place for that to take and, place. And, and once the cesium is there, then subsequently to mobilize it in any type of accident would be extremely difficult to do. Mm -hmm. right. So this, this is sort of an intermediate elevation. Of course, we've got two more up above us. Um, at this point, there's not all that much that's exciting to point towards, except we do have here one of our sight glasses. And this is one of the things that we use both when we're filling to verify that we know what the level is, although we also see the level come up in the various different manometer lines. But also, under force circulation, we monitor this to make sure that we've gotten rid of all of the gas bubbles, mm -hmm. right? because there's a few high points here that collect it, although all the high points in the loop have vents to get the gas out. Okay, maybe we should go up one more. Go up one more. Now we're coming up onto level two, from level zero and then level one. We have the high point of the primary loop of the FHR. Uh, and so, in fact, you can see here the level indicator on the tank, right down here. And this is the top oil level in the loop. And you'll find various different places where you'll record the same level. So if we could see through everything, we would see all right. the oil is at this level. Right. And if you come, if you look over here, this is the first station where we do oil level in the manometer rack, right? And if you look carefully, if you get the light right, because that's transparent, our camera does a better job actually sometimes than the eye does. We'll be able to see, yes, right here, all of the orange manometer lines are primary loop manometer lines, and you'll see the oil levels 
I'll go across from here to here. It's out of batteries. Oh, okay. Out of battery? Yeah. Oh. So these are the manometers that show pressures in the main part of the loop. And when we run the loop, uh, what you'll observe is the, 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 the oil levels will depart due to the pressure drops. Uh, we actually also can spot in, in, in these manometer lines the daily fluctuation in temperature in the room. Mm -hmm. Because some of these lines run all the way down to the bottom of the loop and they stay very close to the room temperature, air temperature. The ones that are uh, in the insulated piping lag and so day to night the temperature goes up and down in the room. You'll see that effect. Here. You'll see it, a, a millimeter or so of oil oh, level okay. difference. That's interesting. And of course, in our, in our calculations, we take into account the actual temperature of, of these lines so that we can get the pressure to, to very, very accurate values. Um, this fan cooler down here is the one that simulates the coil tube air heaters that remove heat from the primary loop. And again, it's, it's on a variable frequency drive. So we can control the speed, and we've shown that we can actually control to give a, uh, a, um, a specific heat removal from that location at the correct elevation in the loop. Uh, this, you'll see, is the fourth Coriolis meter, and this is the one that is measuring the flow rate in the natural circulation decay heat removal loop, the Drax loop. Uh, if we go up one more level, we'll be able to see and there's, this is the camera that does, that takes the data for the manometer, the first set of manometers. And of course, modern cameras are phenomenal. Uh, watch your step coming up. Oh, I see there's another camera there to take that. Level. Exactly. And the blue manometer lines yeah, are the ones on the Drax loop. And you can actually see the oil levels in those lines over there. Because they reference over to the top head tank. So that course, oh, so there's the same level in this yep. pipe as well. Isn't that remarkable that no matter where it is, they're all at exactly the same level? And now, because this is buoyantly driven, we'll see much smaller changes in height and in head. Now, another thing I'm going to talk to the students, because every now and then you'll find a gas bubble. This, you can see this was a bit of a challenging line because it is so close to being horizontal. Yeah. But uh, keeping, keeping sure that we don't have bubbles in the system is something that we've learned a lot about here. And it's something you want to think about if you're designing a real reactor yeah, where you can't see the bubbles so easily. Yeah. This is the, uh, again, variable speed drive fan oil cooler that allows us to uh, mimic the heat removal that our coiled tube heat exchange, or our thermosiphon cooled heat exchanger uh, would, would achieve to extract heat out of this loop and drive natural circulation. Mm -hmm. And the observation in our initial transients is that this thing loves to suck heat out uh -huh. uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the loop. Now, the only other thing that I would point to is down there, you can see this valve right here. That's a needle valve. And by adjusting the position of that needle valve, we have the ability to adjust the amount of flow resistance in this loop. And of course, it's the balance between the flow losses and the buoyancy forces that determines the flow rate and determines the temperature difference. So we can actually adjust those, those losses in this loop across a wide range, and therefore we can simulate a wide range of different de, uh, Drax designs mm -hmm. uh, with, with this one facility. Okay. So well, this is really, really neat. <laughs> Thank yep. you for showing it to us. Okay, you're welcome. Let's see if we can make our way down. Juice. We'll try to go quick. Okay. This is our fourth floor laboratory. I can smell that smell now that I know what it is. Yep, exactly. There's still some residuals around here because we ran our last set of Dowthorn experiments a few weeks ago mm -hmm. uh, where we were doing uh, heat transfer measurements in heated tube as well as there's a small test section over here uh, that. Uh, uh, where we can do heat transfer uh, uh, measurements to and from pack bed of spheres, which gives us the ability to predict heat transfer coefficients from pebbles to salt for the pebble bed uh, fluoride soap cooled high temperature reactor. This loop also allowed us to do uh, heat transfer experiments, as I mentioned before, uh, in heated tubes, and we can compare that heat transfer coefficient data to data for FLIB and show that they're very, very close. 
And then we also did natural circulation here and, and validated models for natural circulation because the heat, the heat removal from this loop is up at a high elevation, heat source is at a lower elevation, and we're able to generate natural and forced circulation flows and validate the, the, the relap models. We also have a series of experiments that we've been doing that relate to being able to use pebble fuel in a salt-cooled reactor. Now, pebble fuel was developed by the Germans back in the 60s and 70s uh, for helium-cooled reactors. They went in the direction of pebble fuel. In the United States, we went towards fixed prismatic fuel. And so their designs, which have now been replicated in China, uh, would circulate pebbles by adding pebbles to the top of a bed and removing them from the bottom of the core. And a typical pebble might go eight times through the core before it reaches sufficient burn up that you'd replace it uh, with a, a new pebble. Now, the key challenge that we were running into with trying to do solid fuel with molten salt coolant is the fact that graphite is less dense than salt and floats. And therefore, fuel elements want to float. And this is a real headache if you've got fixed solid fuel like plate or prismatic. Uh, in 2006, trying to figure out how to solve this problem uh, for the fixed fuel designs that we were focused on, we realized that it might be an advantage that, pebble, that, that fuel floats if you have pebbles. Because in a salt-cooled reactor, you want to have the coolant in a vessel that has no openings around the bottom. That is a pool type of configuration, which means you don't want to take the fuel out from the bottom of the reactor, right? You want to take it from the top. You want to take it from the top. And that works out well with pebbles. And it works out really well. And so this experiment, what we did was we uh, basically, as soon as we recognized that we wanted to understand whether we could circulate pebbles, we knew that we'd have to invert it because the invert, the helium design, and we already had been doing experiments where we're matching the fluid mechanics of fluid using water. And if you scale to 40% geometric scale with water, you can match, with water, you can match the Froude number for the buoyancy related forces and the Reynolds number. So all we had to do was to find a 40% scale pebble material uh, that would have the right density ratio with water. Polyethylene. And yes, polypropylene? No, high density polyethylene oh, and yeah. polypropylene also works. I went home that evening and went to the kitchen and started taking out my wife's plastic stuff and cutting it up to see what would float. <laughs> and after destroying a lot of perfectly good, you know, plasticware, I finally got around to cutting up a milk jug. Right, this is science at work. <laughs> That's a, science right. at work. And the stuff floated. And then I looked on the bottom and I looked up the um, the uh, uh, recycle number. Yeah, I actually did the high, same thing when I was looking high, for the same thing. High density polyethylene. Uh, I said, wow, okay. And within 10 minutes on the internet, I'd found vendors that would sell us these one inch diameter uh, uh, high density polyethylene spheres. And we bought, you know, eight or 10,000 of them. And if I'm not mistaken, polypropylene is even cheaper. <laughs> yes, and moreover, when I'll show you in a moment, polypropylene is a little bit lower density. And so we've used it for instrumented pebbles where we're doing x-ray tomography for full beds now. Oh, okay. So anyway, so this was the first experiment. It's what we call a wet prex, pebble recirculation experiment. 8,300 8, pebbles when it was operating inject pebbles into the coolant line, they get carried in, deposit on the bottom, and then defuel by just scooping them out from the top. We then decided that to get the higher power density, since pumping power is so low with the salts, the huge volumetric heat capacity, we, we found that if we went down to three centimeter diameter instead of six centimeter, so the, the gas-cooled reactors use billiard ball size, went down to half that size, uh, we could go to power densities four to five times higher than what you have in a healing cooled reactor, vastly more compact. The fuel reaches full depletion much more rapidly, and we actually, the startup fissile is very similar to what you have in an MSR mm -hmm. at these power densities, right? Because it's very similar power density to the, the, exactly. the, the fluid fuel, so very little fissile, about one third of the amount that you need to start up a light water reactor to get a, uh, a solid fuel molten salt reactor to work. Uh, as with the, the fluid fuel. So as we went to the smaller pebbles, of course, we had to procure smaller pebbles, as you can see up there. Those are uh, half inch diameter. So when I was and here before, this was all filled up with the multicolored pebbles. That's right, just like in the picture there. Oh. 
And that, we're, that's what I saw when I was here. Yeah, and we were demonstrating oh, wait, that. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Here we go. Yeah, right over you here. got some more. Actually, come, the best way to do it is come around this way. We've got all of the Prex experiments. You can see we've done a ton of them. This one, this is dry. And this one is, is for a 900 megawatt core. Uh, it's a 15 degree segment. And at this point, as we go to large cores, the key thing is that we need a place to insert reactivity control elements, not in the outer radial graphite reflector, but on the inside one. And that's the reason that we've been looking at center reflectors uh, as places to insert control elements. And we were able to demonstrate that we can generate radial zoning. Yeah. And also, you'll see that there's very interesting dynamics. So in this case, because it's dry, the pebbles are coming in from the bottom. But look on the right side. Notice how those pebbles move faster in the expanding region than the ones that are coming straight down. And you can see those gray lines that have moved faster. As you get to the constant area region, note that the gray stripes all have the same shape, which indicates that the whole bed is moving in plug flow. And then as you get to the converging region, the opposite thing happens, and the pebbles that are on the inside move the fastest, and the pebbles on the outside are the ones that move the slowest. Being able to understand how fuel moves is really critical. And we've been able to make advances in understanding these kinds of granular flows and in simulating them. Uh, this is a very, very heavily studied field of science, because if you think about it, uh, grain silos, avalanches, sand heaps. There's all kinds of situations where we care about how granular materials move and flow. And the same thing applies if we're going to be using pebble fuel in reactors. So what we did was to design a new experimental facility that allows us to do 3D x-ray tomography of packed beds of pebbles. And the types of pebbles that we're using are the same size. These are polypropylene but they have embedded in them a 0.3 millimeter diameter tungsten wire. Oh yeah, I see that was a little wire in there. And with x-rays we can readily image these wires and by observing how they rotate as they move, we can actually track thousands of pebbles, centroids, and rotation. Because if you think about it, the rotation is going to be as important in affecting how the bed moves as just the translation as well. Mm -hmm. So using these instrument pebbles in this facility here, which we call x -prex, and if you take a look inside... Oh, this I have not seen. That test section there, the conical one, is designed to match the geometry of the new Chinese TMSRSF test reactor. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be able to do the entire core of that test reactor in terms of pebble locations and pebble motion uh, uh, during fueling and defueling. And also that means it's possible to do all the neutronic and thermal hydraulic simulation using realistic core geometry mm -hmm. with real random packed uh, which is, uh, which pebble is really beds. challenging for pebble beds. Which is, which is challenging, although our models are getting so much better that in fact we may have better control over where fuel is in a pebble bed almost and control over how coolant flows than we can get with fixed fuel. Because wow. fixed fuel has its own set of uncertainties about the geometry of the system, right? Because yeah. yeah. uh, the subchannels, all of the spacing of all the rods and stuff is not perfectly uniform. Um, so the, the ability to do the x-ray tomography, we've been studying a wide range of different fundamental geometries. This, for example, is just a converging slot mm -hmm. uh, where the bed comes together and then it goes into a slot. We've also been looking at experiments where we insert a blade into the bed itself uh, and the control blade that we can use for reserve reactivity shutdown. And we can actually observe how the pebbles get pushed away at the end of the blade. Wow. and how it inserts and measure the forces. So this has allowed us to validate simulation models for these, pack, you know, for these pebble bed reactors and ultimately I think increases the confidence that we can use pebbles as fuel. And pebbles, pebbles are very interesting because um, if you're going to refuel a solid fuel reactor, mm -hmm. actually this is it's the same thing applies for the fluid fuel, but we're getting closer to fluid fuel. Um, when you change your fuel type in a light water reactor, it's a huge deal. 
you have to you have to get the new vendor to design and you have to figure out the compatibility of the new fuel assemblies with the old fuel assemblies and how you're going to shuffle them and and then the fuel will stay for three refueling cycles before it's fully spent it's very complicated uh, when you start looking at online refueling with pebbles um, you can just put in a few pebbles to test once you verify that the new pebble design that you have is working you can start to just substitute because it's a homogeneous bed new stuff. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you think about how it is that you buy gasoline, right, compared to how it is you buy nuclear fuel these days, buying nuclear fuel, you're locked into your vendor. Yeah. You know, with gasoline, if you want new gasoline, you just go to a different gas station, right? Yeah. And you fill it, you fill up your tank with the new gasoline. You don't worry about it being yeah. exactly identical because it's okay if it mixes up and um, it, everything homogenizes. This happens with pebble fuel? Yeah, I think Okay, good. All right, I think you've got enough anyhow. Yeah. But